introduce myself. My name is John Noriega. I'm the director of the Chicano Studies Research Center. And I'm really thrilled uh, to be able to introduce you to the exhibition we have here of David Damian Figueroa's uh, collection, which we have archived here at UCLA. Uh, we've spent a, a good part of the summer processing it, making it available, and then he's worked with us to pick selections and, uh, for, for the display. And I'll let him explain that to you. Except to say that uh, this guy that wears suits and uh, works for major nonprofit organizations, one day I came in and there was a, a young fellow in a t-shirt and jeans that looked just like him, but was uh, kind of arms deep in uh, papers and folders and whatnot, and realized it was David. Um, I'm going to introduce him shortly, but first, uh, what we'd like to do is have uh, a few words from uh, Dolores Huerta, who needs no uh, introduction. You all know her, of course, as a uh, former regent of the University of California. Um, and so what I'd like to do is introduce her, and if you could join me in doing the regent's clap. <laughs> okay. It's going to come in handy during this year, especially if uh, there's more budget cuts in the uh, university. So can you all join me? Welcome to Lotus Huerta. David Damon and his wonderful reception. Of course, David Damon is a, a very, very good friend of mine. He also comes from Arizona, uh, from Yuma. That's where Cesar Thomas was born. And uh, David actually got the, had the good fortune, fortune to go to school with a lot of Caesar's relatives uh, who disowned Caesar at that time. They <laughs> didn't want didn't to be, be identified with him at all because they all worked for these big growers, right? Uh, that took over the Chavez land. Uh, the original land that Caesar's grandfather and father, they had homestead at that land. And uh, I'm, I'm really, you know, David and I have been friends now for many years, and I've always been uh, <clears throat> kind of uh, happy that he's also been a big supporter of the arts. And uh, you know, he, I know that he supports many artists, and he uh, buys a lot of art, and he doesn't even have any place to hang all the art that he has, okay? <laughs> but uh, he always feels that, uh, that supporting artists is one of the uh, best things that one can do with, with one's money. And I wish that, you know, one of the things, of course, my good friend Barbara Carrasco is here, you know, another great artist. Thank you for a minute. Thank you for being Barbara. Okay. And Barbara is a graduate of UCLA. And I guess we've been friends even longer than I know David ever since he was a very good friend of my uh, son, Vida uh, Huerta, who also went to UCLA, UCLA Medical School here. And one of the things that Barbara and I, we've been having this conversation after the last 20 years or so, about how, you know how every time that uh, we go to these dinners and they give people these horrible little wooden plaques, right? <laughs> or now they've got graduated to little crystals or plastics. <laughs> we always think, wouldn't it be great if they gave a piece of art instead, you know? Yeah, and we should promote that with all of our organizations. No more crystal whatever, you know what I mean? And no more wooden plaques, you know? Let's give a piece of art because our artists need the money. And, uh, you know, we have to promote uh, within ourselves, especially our Latina and our Latino artists, and of course, this is what David Damon has done, uh, you know, ever since I've known him. And the other thing is that um, when we talk about what did art mean uh, to the movement, I mean, so much, you know, the movement, I don't think could have survived without art. <coughs> because the artists affirmed uh, what we were doing. I remember when we had uh, a boycott in Safeway in, in San Francisco, and uh, Rupert Garcia, I uh, made a great, big, beautiful poster of uh, the S on Safeway looking like a snake, right? You know? <laughs> Which everybody loved. And uh, all of this art is so symbolic of the movement, and uh, we are so grateful. And we know that there's been a big difference because uh, I had, and I'm going to say this, may he rest in peace because he's passed away, but a very good friend of mine who was an artist, uh, one of the first uh, Latino artists, a Mexican-American artist who became famous, uh, his name was Peter Rodriguez. Maybe somebody knows about him. Mm -hmm. He was in San Francisco, and uh, you know he started. He was having exhibits, and I went to see uh, Pete. And I said, you know, here we are starting the Farmer Movement. We've got all these strikes going on, and all this activity going on. Uh, could you do something about farm workers? You know, he was raised in Stockton, California, where I was raised. There's farm workers all over the place. His family worked out in the fields, but he went the other way. He wanted to do the commercial stuff, right? And I know it's so hard. Uh, for artists to, to, to be true to movement, because there's no money there. 
You know, there's no money in, in movement art. And so I think we really have to celebrate the artists that have been true to movement, whether it's the farm worker movement, uh, the Chicano movement, uh, you know, our civic action movement, you know, our LGBT community. I mean, we really, those artists are our heroes. And I think that we, uh, and like David has with his life, make sure that whatever we do, that we include our artists, right? That, that they are celebrated and that they are included. Uh, we, had, we were at the Department of Labor uh, with Secretary Solis, and uh, one of the things that we wanted to make sure that they did there was to mention the artists that were part of the movement, not just the people that were on the picket lines or the labor people or the celebrities. What about the artists, right, that really contributed, contributed their time and their talent uh, you know, to be able to make uh, the movement known and, uh, and, and, and that really uh, made it visible so that other people could understand uh, what the movement was about, especially for our young people, right? Uh, just recently, I want to mention that Barbara uh, Carrasco, who's here from LA, of course, uh, was working up there uh, with a lot of the farm worker children. And uh, she helped them design a mural. It was all of their ideas. And then she helped them paint the mural. And I have to tell you, we thought she was going to melt, okay? <laughs> because it was so hot, you know? Uh, but she was over there, and I cannot tell you how much, uh, how much inspiration those young people have and how much pride that they've got, uh, have in, in their mural that they painted. And it's right across from the library, too, where everybody can see it. And before they did that mural, of course, it was nothing but graffiti there. So, you know, as, as we go on, we've got to always, I think, put pressure on our politicians and say, and I know it's a hard fight, but we've got to say we've got to have money for art, not only you know for paintings, uh, but you know for music, uh, you know uh, for drama, for film, uh, for photography, like our great uh, photographer George uh, Rodriguez, okay, one of our icons. Of the world. So, uh, you know that with, with, you know, I remember Eric Fromm. They wrote that little book called Art Is Love. It's a little teeny book. It's just a few pages. But one of the, 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 one of the sentences that I love in that book that says, what, if people uh, do not have art, you know, if, the, if people have to have art to, to, have, to have life. And, and I think the way he put it is something like art is love. And especially for our young people, you know, we could think, if we could have art in our schools, I can assure you that our kids would not be so frustrated, they would not be so angry, because they would be able to, uh, to you know, uh, put, put what their, their feelings into, into their art. And, and there would be a way for that they could express themselves. I have, uh, I have my youngest son. But we do have one artist in our family. Okay, we have the doctor from here, from uh, uh, from UCLA, <laughs> and an attorney, and a chef, and nurses, and teachers, etc. We have one artist in our family. And he's the youngest one. And of course, growing up, he had to compete with the doctor and the lawyer and all these other people. Uh, but you know, he has such this great, it's such a great gift. But like many artists, you know, he has to work his day job, right? He has to work his day job, and he really can't practice his art. So, when arts, are, when artists are able to make that commitment of their lives, and uh, you have to live poorly, and can't also take a poverty vow, I think we really have to celebrate them and, and have to thank them, and thank patrons like David, Damien, for the role, who really make sure that at least he can contribute as much as he can uh, to make artists' lives better. So, and I says David, thank you very much, and thank all of you. Thank you, Dolores. Uh, you, she really hit, I think, upon a really important aspect of what we try uh, to do here, which is to document the history of the Chicano and Latino community. And I'm really uh, pleased and honored to be able to recognize David Damien, both in terms of the work that he has done, but also the service he has provided uh, for history, for the community, by uh, gathering together the materials, the document uh, his life and those who have been important in his life, and then making them available uh, through the archives here. We have a wide range of collections. Uh, we take a very broad and expansive view of what uh, represents the community's history. And it's been very vital uh, to our efforts here to be able to draw on people like David, who not only made his own collection available, but kept gesturing t us towards other people to make sure that we are talking to as many people as possible as we try to identify new collections. Uh, we also try to facilitate the scholarship uh, that goes along with that to show what can be done with these collections to begin writing the history that hasn't been written. And I'm very proud to say that 
we have a book coming out uh, related to one of the collections we have here on uh, an LGBT artist group called Viva. Roland here, and, and the book is going to come out. It's, a, it's really some great work related to the collection, but also the extensive oral histories that the young uh, scholar Rob Hernandez did uh, with the members uh, of the organization, many times here with a video camera in our, in our conference room. And that guy was a graduate student when he started this, is now an assistant professor at UC Riverside. So we're very pleased to have played a role. It's going to be his second book for us, and he's just starting his career this fall. I'd like to uh, briefly introduce uh, David Damien uh, in a little bit different way. We all know him as really a tireless worker for nonprofit organizations, uh, primarily Maldef, and in between as a bit of a sandwich, uh, the double A A A R P. Um, and I've known him in both context and have been impressed with uh, his sense of advocacy and and really pulling. A, a, on a wide range of people together to make things happen, to bring issues to people's attention, and to kind of push the ball forward. But in fact, David has more radical origins. He started with one of those 1960s groups <laughs> that <laughs> set out, formed in the 1960s, he wasn't born yet, but uh, <laughs> formed in the 1960s with the idea of bridging cultural barriers and promoting global understanding through service, and music. And I'm referring, of course, to 1981 when we toured with Up With People. <laughs> <laughs> now, we may think that's, oh, that's kind of funny, but actually, think about it. This has been a guiding, uh, the through line for his career, service and the arts, service and the arts. And this is along the lines of what Dolores was saying, when she was speaking about the arts and the way in which the arts have always been integral to successful social movements. It's about the image and it's about action. And you still have people who think, well, it's just about entertainment, it's about art, it's not the real issue. It is if you're otherwise invisible. As you know, there was an incident at UC Davis with a pepper spraying of students, and they just won a lawsuit. Here, here. Uh, yeah. Yeah. You should know that a lot of the students are actually donating that money. It wasn't about getting money, it was about making a point about freedom of speech. And I kind of jokingly said to a number of my colleagues, well, I increasingly convinced that I was pepper sprayed and many of the staff at the center were, were going to put in a case of, well, you know, it's documented. You have to show that it's documented. Said, yeah, but we're Latino. Video cameras can't capture us. <laughs> you have to realize you don't see us on the news. You don't see us in the movies. You don't see us in television shows. And I think that speaks to the importance of entertainment and art, that it is giving visibility to a group that is otherwise too easy to ignore because you don't see it as part of the national imagination. Um, with that, I just will point out one other thing uh, that I learned about David uh, early on that uh, really impressed me is that in 1990, he was the grand finalist for male vocals, <laughs> Buscando Estrellas, <laughs> Star Search. And I think it speaks to him as somebody who uh, talks the talk and walks the walk, that he understands the life of the artist and the entertainer, He's advocated it, but he's also taken it into the nonprofit sector, where he is really, I think, an embodiment of the kind of barriers that need to be broken down, not just culturally, uh, but in terms of uh, sexuality, in terms of uh, ethnicity, but also in terms of the sense of the relationship of the image to the action, of the arts to advocacy. And so I'm going to invite David up here to really say a little bit about his collection. Uh, the exhibition that we have there, here, but also the many people that have inspired him and been a part of who he is as uh, somebody committed to social service in its own right, but also through arts and entertainment. David. Uh, thank you very much. Um, before I even get started, I would like to um, recognize Priscilla. Could you stand up, Priscilla, please? <laughs> Priscilla Ariano. Yeah. Priscilla is the person responsible for going through everything over here, these boxes. It's tedious, tedious, <laughs> tedious, tedious work to catalog and to go through all my things. And to, um, there's just so many, I mean, she, she knows my, my life up and down. And it's really amazing for someone to make meaning out of, um, all these papers, and I know I was collecting on um, 
I don't know what it was why I was collecting, but I think um, the reason why I was collecting, you helped me discover that, and I'm very grateful. And it's because I think that we, um, when we're going, when we're a part of history, when we're around historic people, when we're in opportunities that um, says, wow, this is really amazing. Some I should have, so-and-so should be here with me. Um, you want to save these things, you want to document them, because they're not really just for us, they're for everyone. Everyone is actually um, a part of it. And um, I just wanted to say that. And the second thing I wanted to say, I'm very grateful to you, very, very grateful. Right. And um, yeah. I wanted to also talk about um, Sean and the, the leadership that Sean and Lisette and Chris and Rebecca and Patty who's over there and the, the spirit of, I hope I didn't miss anyone. Chris is over here, Lisette over here, Patty in, in the back there, um, Sean. And, and everyone else who works for the Chicano um, Studies Research Center, um, they really, really believe in preserving, um, you know, our, our, our history. And I think a lot of us who go through life and we don't think that we're doing anything that is particularly important, but everything we do has meaning. Every single thing that we do has meaning. And I just think you just to recognize what you're doing and the people that you're meeting and the people that you're collaborating with and to save some of those things. Um, I really I want to recognize a lot of the people that are here that are iconic in their own sense. Uh, that that um, My mom, you know, we're talking about dichos and my mom used to always say, um, show me who your friends are and I will tell you who you are. Everybody knows that, <laughs> right? And so, you know, I have incredible, incredible, incredible friends. I mean, I, um, I could look in the back, there's Kimberly Arn. Kimberly, raise your hand. Kimberly worked with August Wilson, the, the famous wow. playwright. She's Tony nominee. This is my friend, you know? George Rodriguez, iconic photographer. Barbara Carrasco, iconic artist. Ima Resendez, social, you know, social impact work. Roland, who's one of our most important LGBT leaders at the West Coast. Amazing, amazing work. Dolores. Um, <laughs> you see her throughout here. Alma Martinez. You know, you look at, uh, um, who am I missing? Wait a minute. Yolanda Gonzalez. Where? Richard Yarbrough and my dear friend Mary Lou Fulton. The, the fabulous Marion Ramsey, who you know from Police Academy and all the Broadway shows and all that. So um, did I, if I miss anybody, I'll, I'll see you in a second and I'll please. But you know, these are the, the people that are represented in these, um, in the artwork. Um, Dolores is absolutely right. I think that I've given away more art than I actually have. And I think everybody here has been a recipient of that. And I think that um, it's very important to support artists. I think artists are chosen people. I think that they have a calling, just as anybody who would be um, a priest, people who work in the kind of work that we do, they have a calling to want to express themselves. And we have a responsibility as regular people to, um, to support their work. We really, really do, whether they're acting, whether they're singing, whether they're filming, um, whatever you do in the arts, I think we have a responsibility to support. And we particularly have a responsibility, I think, to support our own um, our own community, Latino producers, Latino artists. You know, if we're uh, African American producers, we have the we have the responsibility to support our own. Um, I know that sounds a little radical, and I say so what. Um, <laughs> we need to do that. We really, really need to do that. But I wanted to tell you a little bit about my mom. Um, Lisette was responsible for choosing the photo that was in the, um, the, the representative <laughs> um, photo for the archive, uh, for the collection in this, this exhibit. And that photo um, represents a very, very, um, it just, it's a wonderful, to me it's a beautiful image, but what was really going on at that time was a lot of turmoil, a lot, a lot of turmoil. It was the beginning of what we call the end of our family. Figueroa family. You know, my mom and my dad were having a very, very difficult time keeping their marriage together. You know, all kinds of problems going on. My mom went to go work in the fields, we went to go work with her in the fields, and 
there's a lot of craziness, a lot of homelessness off and on, and so many things were happening during that time. Um, going to Yuma was absolutely something that saved myself, saved me, uh, my stepmom. But I, you know, I, um, my mom meant well. My mom uh, had this pathology that, that she had inherited that went on for, um, you know, for until the day she died. And um, I think that what she was really trying to tell me in all of these different um, sayings is that I want you to have something better than I have. And to see the possibilities of what could happen if you applied yourself without an education. She didn't have an education, and I hated school. I <laughs> completely hated school because I just thought, you know, I just don't have the discipline to do that. But I think that with all of what she was telling me, it set up this incredible um, thought process. And I don't think that everything that she taught me, I reserved it, I conserved it, and I applied it. And that's how I met so many different people like Dolores, like everyone in this room. Um, I, um, I put all of these invitations here to the White House. I've been to the White House, I, I think at least seven times. Seven times, um, is here. and for you young kids that are here, I want you to open them up. I want you to look at what those invitations look like. One day, you will go, and you will say, oh, this is what it looks like. But for me to be there, I felt like I was representing everybody in my family, everybody who, um, you know, who didn't have a chance to, to experience some of these things. But I, um, I know I'm going all, all over the place, but I, um, I just feel that, you know, just with, without, um, going too, too much into everything. I think that the incredible experiences, the story behind um, that photo that you see there um, with Secretary Solis, Dolores Huerta, and Eva Longoria. The secretary had called me. Dolores gave her my, my personal information. And she was, I want to talk to Eva. And we set up that meeting. And I can't disclose what was being discussed in that, but you can only imagine, you know, what's going on, and this is a very recent photograph, that is a photograph that George took, and there's stories behind, very powerful stories behind these photos. The one over here, um, that's a very, very rare photo of Cesar Chavez. Very rare photo, and I'm so grateful to have these in my collection. And all of these things will be, um, we donated to um, the Chicano Studies Research Center. Um, on, the, on the outside case, you will find, on the outside in the hallway, you will see Ricky, uh, Dolores' son, who was the artist. She commissioned uh, a piece of pottery for me, a pot, and um, it's out there. Um, and you'll see just different things. It just, I think, a snapshot of the kind of life I've lived. And it's like so, um, it's surreal. Coming from Yuma, coming from very, very humble beginnings. I know a lot of sacrifices were made. and. Um, and just unbelievable. My life is unbelievable to me and some of the things that I go through in a day, in a week, in a month. And I think that um, I just want to just thank you so much for everything, for having this. I, um, there's also um, a painting outside that uh, Margaret Garcia did in some me and my partner, Jimmy. And my mom used to always say, say it again, she was very progressive because she told my brothers to come in one day for a meeting. And she goes, I want to talk to all of you um, because I want you to, to make mommy a, a promise. And the promise was that your brother is very, very special. And you have to promise me that you will always protect him. So she would always say, when so she see gay guys, she would always say, son compañeros. And so that's what you see there. And so, you know, I just um, I want to thank Jimmy for, you know, for all the support you've given me and all of everything. Jimmy is now on all of these things with Chris, who's Chris, Chris, Chris is back there. They hung everything. And I just, you know, I'm just very grateful. I just, this is, this is beyond my wildest expectations to be able to um, exhibit this. But, you know, all these things do not belong to me. They really don't. They're really meant for 
other people to learn from, and and um, they don't be, they don't really belong to me. I don't think really anything belongs to me. So things just actually, um, I think, hold us up from being the person that we want to be. Um, we have to you know, shed different things in order to do different things and ex experience. Um, I wanted to tell, share just a couple of things from the collection that I pulled. One of them is, um, is uh, uh, George Rodriguez. Stand up, George, please. Yes, yeah, George. George. <laughs> George is one of my very, very best friends. George um, makes these greeting cards, and he uses old, old greeting cards, and he makes a greeting card. So he knew I was, when I went to um, DC, he knew I was missing my friends. And so he made this card, it's of Tom Sines, who's my boss and my friend, going out to, uh, the, the, um, to sue someone. <laughs> and it says, this is April 28th, uh, 2004. David thought you'd get a kick out of this. This is Tom leading day laborers. Tom is the godfather of the day labor movement. In Glendale, on the way uh, on the way to City Hall to file lawsuit for harassment by Glendale police. Take care, of George R. So that's <laughs> and so you, there's a lot of these in my collection. Uh, there's another one there um, that he took that um, that that was uh, the event that I put together for Maldiv uh, for Vicente uh, Vicente, for that, Vicente Fox's um, yeah Vicente Fox's um, first official visit to um, the United States. To the United States, and somebody was protesting out. Uh, out, out. <laughs> this is. Uh, um, I want you to. I, I wanted these there for people to be actually to touch them, feel them, open them. This is um, the program for the Presidential uh, Medal of Freedom, and this is when Dolores received her Presidential Medal of Freedom. <laughs> Dolores Clara Fernandez Huerta, and um, it says, one of America's great labor and civil rights icons, Dolores Clara Fernandez Huerta, has devoted her life to advocating for marginalized communities. Alongside Cesar Chavez, she co-founded the United Farm Workers of America and fought to secure basic rights for migrant workers and their families, helping save thousands from neglect and abuse. Dolores Huerta, has never lost faith in the power of community organizing. And through the Dolores Huerta Foundation, she continues to train, mentor new activists to walk the streets into history. And that's what you've been for me. That's what you've been for me. Um, Dolores calls me, and we have this amazing, amazing conversations and amazing arguments. <laughs> we don't see eye to eye on some things, but we're both Aries. And we, <laughs> she says we're both Aries, and and, and we're um, we're just very very um, close friends. You'll see a lot of women in the, in um, in the collection. You see a lot of women are represented in, in the, the the archival boxes. I figured that out through Priscilla because I think that happened because um, my mom died so early, and I never had a sister. So when you look at Alma and Diane Rodriguez and Cynthia and you know Irma and different people that, that are very close, to, you know, I'm, I'm very, um, I'm very, um, I have a great affinity for women. Um, I, I <laughs> <laughs> so I just not, I just don't want to, you know. <laughs> But you know, I, I just think that the women, women, you know, Dolores knows I'm a feminist. Women are, women are the ones that, you know, I was talking to my stepmom, women are the ones that, like when my mom was, when I was a young kid, my mom, my dad would come home from work and there would be, she would light his cigarette, make him a drink, have his slippers, his newspaper, and cook him dinner. And that was part of the pathology of, of being a good woman. And she always, that was against her grain, but that she was taught that's what you needed to be to be a good woman. So I think that was the conflict in her life. You know, I think that was really the conflict. Um, I think before I just close up, I wanted to say um, my friend Mary Lou Fulton, could you stand up, Mary Lou? <laughs> <laughs> Mary, you know, I was born on the on the, the day um, Martin Luther King was assassinated. 
Um, I was uh, raised where Cesar Chavez was born and where he died. And I went to work for a woman um, at Maldiv. Her name was Antonia Hernandez. She's right over here. Mm -hmm. And my mother's name was Antonia Hernandez. <laughs> so I think that, you know, there are no mistakes. There's signs everywhere we look. You just have to pay attention. You just really have to pay attention. Mm -hmm. Maya Angelou is one of the people that I just adore and read all of her stuff. She, I, we were born on the same day. And so you just have to look at things like that. Dolores and I were into dates and all of that thing. So we're, um, but that's what I want to say. Um, I pointed out to Mary Lou because we went to a school, Yuma High School. Our mascot was called, um, it was the criminals. We had a bit of a difference because she and I used to sing in a group very much like the Glee Club that you see on TV. Believe it or not, in Yuma, Arizona, in 1970, before we even started high school, there was a group, it was a glee club, that had a, uh, a rock and roll band, that had singers that could sing pop 40 songs and blow anybody on American Idol out the water, you know, out the, out <laughs> of the room. And that's what we were, that's what we did. And that's how I ended up um, escaping. I was a criminal, so we escaped from Yuma. I'm not married as <laughs> but um, that's how I was able to like from one day be in Yuma, Arizona and then a month later after going to boot camp and up with people performing for the King and Queen of Spain and going throughout Europe so I think that the arts have this amazing amazing uh, ability to give us things that um, it would take us to just heights and places and um, one, one closing thought I want to say is you know, the Chicano Studies Research Center is here. Please um, <coughs> go on their website. Many of you are here, and I am recruiting. You should have your archives here. I highly <laughs> encourage you to have your archives here. If it's not your entire archive, at least a portion of it, you should donate some things to this, to this resource center. It's important. You have a responsibility <laughs> to do it. And I, I encourage you. They will take care of uh, your items and they will be studied by people for years to come when we're all in here. And that's all I have. Does anybody have questions or anything? All right, how much time do I have? How much, what time is the university closed? <laughs> <laughs> how much time do we have? Uh, well, we've got about 20 minutes. OK, we'll, we'll take it less. Anybody have a question? Um, are you? No, go with them okay. first. Uh, Yolanda, please stand up. <laughs> this, is, this is Chicana royalty. Yolanda oh, okay. <laughs> Gonzalez. You'll see her work outside in the case. And it's when did you start collecting art? What was um, your first art piece? JD and Diane, who were here earlier, I don't think they're here. They introduced me to Patsy Valdez. Um, I ended up living on, this, on the same street as Patsy Valdez in Echo Park. And um, Patsy was the kind of person that would, um, you know, really, we had a, a great connection. And she wanted, you know this, certain artists want you to have their pieces in your collection or want to start, start you up to, um, so I, every time an income tax would come, I would go and buy something for Patsy. And that's how I had, um, was able to collect these pieces. And I've given away more pieces of Patsy's work than I actually have. But I kept I some one. some rare ones. <laughs> I have one. And so does Dolores has one too. Who else with has one? Give them back. <laughs> 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 Who else? You have a question? Um, anybody else have a question? Because I have one. Something well, those pieces that I gave you, I'm sorry, Alma. Those no. pieces that I gave you, you need to donate them. <laughs> yeah. oh, does anyone else have a question? Because I have something kind of special to ask you. Okay. No, right? I'm not going to do that. Okay. <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh. So this is the next no, really, you won't. <laughs> no, I won't. I, no, you won't? Just I'm a little really bit? No. A little bit. A little okay, bit. let me, let me like I'll Obama, finish. Like Obama did. Like Obama did. Yes. Okay, I'll do it a little bit. Like Obama. So we're just, okay. where's the question? Where's the question? Please, somebody have a question. So you must have, I mean, it was not easy to choose what you wanted to donate and you know, what uh, you kept. So how did, you know, how did you make that decision? Well, I started out um, by writing stories, and so I think I have the beginnings of a book. And thank you for asking that question, Roman. I really appreciate it because it morphed. I was not planted, by the way. There was not. <laughs> but we, we do those things we, to be for each other. Um, and what I did is, you know, it's, I'm glad you asked because I was going to read. I wasn't going to read them, but I want to read one. What I did is, I had a very direct, different direction this was going in, and I had actually 
wrote a par written a paragraph about Jose Jose. I wrote a paragraph about Richard Chavez. I wrote a par paragraph or two about Dolores, Alma, Diane, different people, George, and I didn't, um, and Mary Lou. Um, but, you know, I, I have them. And as we were moving forward, it was really something that we had to streamline and really have uh, make sense and be true to the original mission of what we wanted to accomplish. But this is um, one, it's called, It is Better to Give Than to Receive. My mother was a farm worker. At times when she, didn't, when she didn't have a babysitter, she would take us to work with her in the fields. I followed her down each row. I used to complain a lot about how hot it was. This was in Arizona. <laughs> she would create different tactics to distract us from the harshness of the sun. She taught me to memorize old Mexican songs by singing them over and over, and that is how I learned to sing. She taught me prayers, and I learned to believe. Mommy, it's hot, I complain. I know, viejo. My, the reason my mom called me viejo is because she always said I had an old spirit. To, and I was really a lot of times her parent when I look back. My mom's nickname for me. No te des, don't give up. She'd respond by saying, say barbas de oro. And who's worked in the fields before? Anybody here? Okay. Barbas de oro. I don't know what this is. Barbas de oro, barbas de oro. And the wind will start blowing. The barbas de oro um, was, the smith, was a mythical man with a golden beard that would blow the wind through his mouth and cool the earth. My mother was a very resourceful and practical, practical person. She used to make um, lots of burritos with raw potato mixed with refried beans, wrap them in foil and place them under the, uh, the windshield, you know, the windshield of the car, mm -hmm. and in the sun it would cook them. Um, so the blazing sun would cook them. When she would uh, get her lunch break, she would serve them up to everyone. I remember her sharing our food with the workers who didn't have anything to eat. I will never forget that. That left an indelible impression in my mind. It is also how I try to live my life today. I look back at how much courage it took my mom to stay positive, smile, sing, whistle, tell jokes, and tell stories from the past while doing break, heart back breaking work. I'm grateful to her for teaching me how to sing, pray, and believe. My mother passed away in a tragic accident in 1985. I believe that even though a loved one passes away, our relationship with them can continue to be strengthened through prayer. And this is called, It's Better to Give Than to Receive. Can you talk about what, what the art says to you when you want, what, is there a particular kind of art piece that you gravitate towards? Because I see there's a common theme here with, uh, with obviously the farm workers, but if there's anything else that, uh, that jumps at you. Well, when I, when, I, um, when I look at a piece of art, I look at it because it, I, I have, um, it speaks to me in a way that, like, things that remind me of my mom or, or things that, that, you know, it's sort of these um, places you go to that, you know, you wish you could create. In many ways, and been to my home, I like to create those experiences in my house, you know, make it look like the painting in many ways, the ambiance of the painting. And so it's really about an experience. It's really about, like, when you buy a nice shirt and you want that, that fits really beautiful and you want to wear it to, the, you know, to a gala or something. That's the, how the art is. You want to share it with people. And then, you know, so much that, you know, I buy it and then <laughs> give it away. <laughs> so, it's, it's crazy, I know. So is that, that answer your question? Yes, David, did, what, can you share maybe one of your first early recollections of when you started being a community servant? Um, I think the first, well, um, well, I think that I, I can, I'll, I'll go back to when um, Mary Lou and I were in, in high school and we used to always um, do fundraising. Um, we would sell grapefruits at the swap meet. Do you remember that, Mary Lou? We would sell grapefruits at the swap meet so we could take trips with, with school. And, and, and we, we actually you know, gave the money back. We didn't keep it. We gave it to the, to the school fund so that some other kids could go to school, uh, go on the trip as well who couldn't afford it. So that, that's probably, the, I used to um, do uh, calling, phone banking, calling for Barry Goldwater. I did his last campaign. He said it's Barry Goldwater. <laughs> Dolores is like, oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> this is where we disagree on some things. You know, I'm a Democrat, being a diner, but we love Barry Goldwater. I don't know. We, did, we, we worked with him on very um, patriotic uh, shows and things like that. We, so. Dolores is like, <laughs> I've just embarrassed her. I've just ashamed her. But we did. It was it was about the experience. You know, I learned I learned how to I learned how to do calling you know, on, on the phone. So it was like you know that's a big part of what I do now. 
good. Um, is there a definitive moment that you can say, this is where I became an activist, radical activist, meaning where you wanted to make change on a, just a profound level? Maybe it had to do with your, your, um, I, you know, identity as a gay man. Maybe it had to do with, you know, I don't know, farm workers. Is there like a, a, a specific moment where you became radical? You had to. Was something that just changed you? Yeah, I think that the first. Time, thank you. Um, well, Dolores, Tom Sines, Linda Ronstadt, Richard, um, Chavez, um, Dan Guerrero. Patricia Casado. I remember there was a delegation of us from LA that, gone, that went to Arizona to announce Maldives' lawsuit on SB 1070 against the state of Arizona. That's when I really felt, you know, that we we're really doing something like very, very powerful. Something that we were really, really coming together to put together to know those folks and to get on a conference call and everybody say we're going to go. We're going to follow you over there. I felt that I was in a position um, that was pretty amazing to be able to do that and to work on SB 1070 all the way till it's almost finished with some amazing attorneys and the people that we work with. Um, I think that's you know all that whole process coming back to Maldiv has really been something that has been transformative in many many ways, um, and so I think. That's the whole, it's been a process, but I think that was like, I had to look at one day, that would, that would be it. And it was very, it was like 45 TV cameras there. It was, it, it, it was very, very hateful, um, you know, uh, that Arizona Latinos had forgotten that, that we were patriotic, that we had, people had forgot about that, our contributions. You know, so we were, I, it changed me so much that I wanted to do this project, you know, the, the project that Mary Lou and I, uh, did with the Ronstads. It's called America Our Home. It's a CD, and we did a short film. It's transformative. It's uh, very. It was an amazing, amazing experience.